she'll be talking with Carolyn Denard, who's a professor here as well, and, and founded the Tony Morrison Society. So it'll be an interesting, interesting uh, meeting. And then, of course, we always have our beloved Bruce seg uh, segment on October 15th. And one of my favorite stories, Temple of the Holy Ghost, after all this dread and, and fear, I, I'm, I'm happy we go to that one, Bruce. And uh, that will be at 4.30 and 7. And so we'll see you then. So let's just get started on the life you say and maybe your own. People always complain that there's so much death in O'Connor. And usually when I get to the end of the semester and I ask students to rank the stories, how much they like, the stories where nobody dies always end up at the bottom. And I say, you know, you complain about all the deaths and then you vote for all the stories where everybody gets killed. So that's one thing about, that's one thing about uh, Temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay, the life you say may be your own and this is the perfect day to be talking about that story because the hurricane came to town uh, today and um, it uh, broke forth and washed a lot of the slime from this earth for us. And uh, <clears throat> it's, um, it's been quite the day. I've, I've heard people having conversations about how many inches of rain we've been getting in the last 24 hours. And, and um, you know, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, well, let's, let's start with, with titles. Um, because it's got something to do with the oddness of this, of this story. Um, the title is based on a sign you might see by the side of the road over the last several decades. I saw one of these signs recently on the Georgia College campus asking people to drive safely around a construction zone because the life you save may be your own. Um, I would imagine uh, O'Connor saw such, such signs uh, along the highway and was amused by them, um, thinking that, you know, you probably can't save your own life. That's just, um, that's just a modern folly, I suppose. There are other titles that she thought about putting on this story. Uh, at one point, it's going to be called A Personal Interest. At another point, it was going to be called The World is Almost Rotten. And I can see some sense to, um, you know, both of those titles along with the one that she, that she settled on. O'Connor did a lot of drafting of this story and thinking about how she might extend the story and how she might um, provide flashbacks to the story also. Apparently, she kind of thought it was, uh, you know, the, the story had the potential to grow into a novel. She tried it out in a few ways. And she finally decided to cut it back a lot, maybe too much, <laughs> um, and leave us with the question of what's going to happen to um, Lucy Nell, the daughter, at the, at the, end, of the, uh, at the end of the story. Let me talk about these, these uh, uh, variants. There's an alternate ending in which um, apparently Mrs. Crater wins her battle with Mr. Shiflet that's gone on all the way through the story by tricking him into getting onto a train, not into a car with Lucy now, so I, I guess the implication is she's kind of in control of where they're gonna go and they're gonna have to come back, you know, like they're going to be a married threesome or something. There is an alternate ending in which um, Mr. Shiflet, after he has dumped Lucy Nell at the hot spot, goes home. And it turns out that one of the fake names that he mentions in the middle of the story to uh, Mrs. Crater it turns out to be his real name and he walks into the house and there's his wife and there are his kids and he takes one look at his kids watching the television and he's just, just so disgusted with his life at that point that he takes a baseball bat and bashes in the television and that's the end of the, and that's the, end of the manuscript. 
um, you know, that's kind of interesting that that O'Connor could have him steal the car for his freedom when he isn't going to free himself with the with the car he's managed to get in the course of the story. That's a um, that's a rather odd place for her to have taken the story. And then there's the stuff about um, Mr. Shiflin's childhood, some of which has been some of which has been published. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, uh, highlights of that are um, Mr. Shifflett's mother takes him to school for advising about how to raise her son and is told that he should be allowed to do anything he wants to do. Uh, no no uh, constraints should be put on him. Whatever he takes an interest in, that's what he should learn. Sounds like a kind of, you know, 25 words or less version of the kind of education O'Connor wanted to avoid for herself. She didn't want to be in charge of choosing what she was going to study. She wanted people who knew um, about what should be taught to force her to learn it. Um, maybe the final title, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, has something to do with education. You know, that Mr. Shiflett was given that kind of option and apparently what he did with his freedom was to try to um, create a machine that would be a car and a submarine and an airplane, that he had this grand vision of all that a car could be. And of course, he never goes anywhere with it. At least that tells you that O'Connor thought a lot about the car symbol and what she's going to make of it in uh, in writing this in writing the story and trying out all the possibilities and deciding on what she's going to do um, with it. O'Connor wrote the, I mean, next thought. O'Connor wrote this story at about the same time that she wrote the river. The story she this the story we talked about um, um, last month, and I think. She finished this story a little bit before she finished The River. But I guess the point is that um, it's reasonable to speculate about connections between the stories. If she's going back and forth between writing drafts about what's going to happen to little Harry Bevel Ashfield and then going to what's going to happen to Lucy Nell Crater, you know, two kind of abandoned um, figures, people who are abandoned by people who ought to take care of them and be responsible. Um, you know, maybe we should think about those, about those characters in relation to each other more than we, more than we typically um, do. Let's talk a little bit about names in this story, starting, talking about the name Shiftlet is too easy. Everything you think of when you think of the name Shiflet, yes, it applies to Mr. Shiflet. It's almost too easy, a multiple choice question where it's all of the above. Um, what puzzles me is what we're supposed to make of the mother and daughter both being named Lucy and Elk Crater. Um, I've been told repeatedly, including today, that it's a Southern thing, not uncommon to, for a, a mother and a daughter to have this, to have exactly the same name. And I don't know why I think of that as an oddity in the story. Goodness knows men do that all the time. You know, Joe Smith the third, Joe Smith the fourth, Joe Smith the fifth. We don't, we don't think much of that. Well, we think we think might think that's a little bit odd, but um, it's it's just something that men do and that women don't do. And um, um, but it seems meaningful. And she says, you know, that that the daughter has exactly the same uh, exactly the same name. What are we going to do with the name Crater? I suppose there are a lot of things you can do. It's hard for me to find positive associations <laughs> to attach to the word uh, crater. Um, 
Lucy Nell seems like a perfectly innocent, positive, sweet name uh, for somebody to have. I don't think of that as particularly symbolic, and so it makes me think Crater is, is uh, uh, where it's at. Um, you know, kind of makes me think that, that um, they're in a bad way, I guess. Um, perhaps an unrelated thought, but it popped into my head today as I was reviewing the, uh, when, as I was reviewing the story, am I the last person to notice that Lucy now is older than Mr. Shiflet? I think I've read this story a lot of times and just not paid attention because it's on different pages, but she's probably about a year older. And, and is there any connection with the possibility that we've got an older woman and a younger man? And what's that got to do with um, the daughter being in a relationship through the naming with the mother that uh, means something about her? You know, I mean, I don't know the answer to this. I just see it as a, a, a kind of complicated puzzle. What kind of hints is O'Connor trying to give us about um, about Lucy Nail? And you know that, that age difference. We're we're told that she was nearly thirty, and Mr. Shiflet might be lying, but he says he's twenty eight. It's a wonder he, we're not told he's thirty three. Um, you know, why, why do that? It must mean something, but I'm not sure what. Whole other topic, okay. Um, where does a story like this come from? What are, what are sources? Um, and one of my latest hobby horses to write at every opportunity is um, to think of O'Connor as, especially early in her career, Thinking about her role models here in the um, in the state of Georgia, and having um, and having her stories kind of comment on how she relates herself to these other writers, I see a little bit of a nod or a reaction to Carson McCullers in this story, because the um, the mother wants to kind of wants. Oh, she wants the three of them to go to the courthouse and get married, as if it's a marriage of three people. And that makes me think of The Member of the Wedding, the novel by Carson McCullers in which um, a child, not a mother, thinks that this would be a really cool way to live your life. You know, here's this marriage about to take place and it's just so wonderful, I will just become part of it and go live with them forever and it will all be great. And it's heartbreaking in uh, McCullers, um, when that all falls apart, uh, O'Connor is not is not imitating McCullers particularly with that um, with that pattern, but I think it's there. And then the other connection I see to another major Georgia writer that's floating in the background of this of this story is Erskine Caldwell, um, who is famous for a novel called God's Little Acre, in which a guy goes around digging pits all over his farm because he's sure he's going to strike gold. And uh, I would say, what's he end up with? Not any gold, but a bunch of craters. Uh, maybe that's maybe the name is an allusion to um, Erskine Caldwell. And this fantasy I have about how why Flannery O'Connor might have taken. Erskine Caldwell seriously enough to think about him and to react to him in her writing is what? Uh, that, that when she went to Iowa, I can just imagine that the, um, the guys who were all there on the GI Bill to write the great American war novel and saw this uh, shy Georgian female in their midst probably um, nagged her, tried to get her goat, you know, and sat around thinking, what kind of irritating thing can we say to her? And I can just imagine somebody saying, so are you here to write Tobacco Road? Thinking that would shock her. And uh, I think if you, if you throw a challenge at all, similar to that at a Flannery O'Connor, she's going to get you. She's going to figure out how to 
um, shock you with her reaction. Now, my reading of this story is that to some extent, she is reacting not to Tobacco Road, not to God's Little Acre so much, but to the novel that O'Connor wrote after those two novels, which is called Journeyman, uh, about a phony preacher who, you know, pretends to be godly, kind of like Mr. Shifflin at the beginning of the story, but he's phony and he's just out to take advantage of people at every turn all the way through the, all the way through the novel. And um, the end of the novel uh, is what the most interesting part of, of Journeyman. Um, the, the phony preacher whose name, God help us all, is Seaman Die. Um, he's going to have a, a big revival service and he's going to steal everybody's money. And the way he's going to distract them, I kid you not, is that he's going to turn the revival into a giant orgy. And it works. And the interesting reversal at the, um, at the end is he gets so carried away with his own orgy revival service that he forgets to steal everybody's money and maybe has a little recognition scene that, gee, I'm a total jerk. Um, I don't think that Flannery O'Connor writes like Erskine Caldwell, okay? If you think Flannery O'Connor is cruel to her characters, go read some Erskine Caldwell and you will see that Flannery is sweetness and light. When she says she loves all of her characters, she means it. Erskine Caldwell tried to like his characters, but he could never stop turning on them and making fun of them as dumb, evil hicks that the world would be better off without. And he's just totally inconsistent. He, he'll make fun of them and make fun of them and make fun of them. And then he'll say, oh, I've gone too far. I have to write a paragraph in which I you know, act like I care about these people. He couldn't sustain it. So there are all sorts of passages in, in Caldwell that you can put right next to a passage in O'Connor and say, gee, these are kind of similar. Flannery might read this and care, you know, react. Uh, and I think that when you, when you ask yourself, why did Flannery say such terrible things about people like Carson McCullers and Erskine Caldwell? It's partly that she kind of took them as role models. She kind of imitated them for a while early in her career. And then she decided to cover her tracks and say, I have nothing in common with these people. We're just a total world. We're a total world apart. Uh, now, my mind goes from there to um, um, Galley Proof. There, there are two major film adaptations that use the life you say may be your own, okay? And one of them, she's in New York City in 1955 on local television, live television. She's being interviewed in preparation for the publication of A Good Man is Hard to Find in Other Stories. They do a little dramatization of the life you said may be your own. And halfway through, they stop and the MC turns to O'Connor and says, why don't you tell our audience how the story turns out? And O'Connor rather famously says, no, I will not do that. There's only one way to tell the story. And, you know, I ain't doing what you want me to do. Uh, you know, there are lots of good reasons for her to have said that. But one reason might be that she does borrow plots. Telling the plot's gonna make her sound like she really is similar to some other writers. She wants all the emphasis to be on style, nuance, you know, secondary themes that um, 
enrich what's on the what's on the surface. She doesn't want to tell the end of the story because it might sound like she's just like these other authors she's trying to distance herself from, especially in 1955. Um, did I mention the timing of the story? I, I said something about this was being written at about the same time as uh, uh, The River. She's writing this story at about the same time that she's finding out she's got lupus. You know, about the same time that she says, okay, I've got three years to live. If I live as long as my father lived after he was diagnosed with lupus. And she cranked out all the stories in uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find Another Stories in a you know, pretty short period of time. And, you know, when you look at, when you look at Lucy now, you know, the daughter, in here. This is taking us away from Erskine Caldwell now. If you look at Lucy Nell with her, with her disability, do you see O'Connor in that character? You know, for some readers, there's just no comparison whatsoever that, um, that Flannery O'Connor did not think she had any version of any kind of intellectual um, disability. She needs, she was a genius. And so the last character she would pick was somebody who had a, um, a mental disability. And yet, um, maybe, you know, a, a really different kind of a disability is a way to talk about your own disability without it being too close to, without it being too close to home. And there is that, we go back to the, the, uh, the story's emphasis on the relationship between the mother and the daughter. Uh, surely O'Connor thought that she could write that because she had this, you know, really tight kind of twisted, uh, too close, uh, awkward relationship with her own mother. And, you know, that that, that could feel close to home and um, be something that she could be something that she could write about with great uh, with great originality. Uh, there are also people, I was reviewing some of it today, um, um, talking about this story in relation to Southwestern humor, you know, 19th century stories, of which there are a great many, which are, I would say, kind of like reading Erskine Colville in the 20th century, cruel um, attempts at humor that is, that is so slapstick and so crude and so mean that it's hard to laugh. And if you've never had a taste of that, that uh, body of literature, uh, you know, we never know how much Erskine Caldwell actually read, but um, I think it's a tradition that he comes out of. And I think Flannery O'Connor knew that that was a Southern tradition. It was a Georgia tradition and that, um, you know, she needed to think about where she, um, you know, where she fits into all of this stuff. Okay, uh, let me remind you now, you should just jump right in there and uh, uh, interrupt me whenever you feel like it, folks. Let me Talk change. about the horrors of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Gene Kelly one. Oh, the, the what about the Gene Kelly one? You really didn't talk about the Gene oh, Kelly one. Oh, I didn't talk one. about it, okay. No. no, all right, so let's go to that. Um, the other film version, right, not Beyond Galley Proof. In the late 50s, when he bought a refrigerator for Andalusia's kitchen because she sold the rights to make a film version of, of uh, The Life You Say May Be Your Own. Gene Kelly is the shiftlet character. Uh, Agnes Moorhead plays Mrs. Crater. It has its, what, a few clever moments, but what nobody can forget after they see the film is that they added on a completely different ending that Mr. Shiftlet goes and he meets his little hitchhiker and they have their confrontation and in the um, television version he suddenly realizes that he's a jerk and he should change his ways and he turns around and he goes back to the hot spot where Lucy Nell is eating all the pastries off the counter in the diner and uh, you know management's kind of getting irritated with her and he marches in and heroically saves her and they rush out to the car and drive off to live happily ever after with 
ridiculous grins on their faces. The end. This is what uh, Flannery had to live through, was that she would then, was then congratulated all over Milledgeville by people who had just seen her wonderful story on television and they had no idea she was so good when she thought it was an absolute travesty of her story and she was just glad she got a refrigerator out of it. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful story. Both these films, Galley Proof and it's called The Life You Save, um, are available for viewing in special collections at, uh, at Georgia College and maybe there are pirated copies floating around on the, uh, on the internet. I think they're, I think they're worth seeing, even though, um, you know, you don't really get the sense that you're watching a film version of, of O'Connor's stories, from for story from either from either one of these things. Okay, uh, on to the next big topic on the list. I wanted, the wanted, yeah, uh, Bruce, I wanted to ask, what was the what name, was the name the, that uh, in in the uh, in the extended version, um, or in the in the um, the extra pages, what was the name of, of Shiflet? Uh, from, uh, do you remember? I can't remember. Um, that I have was, my all I can remember is that it's one of those yeah. that he said, I could, you know, he makes that speech to Mrs. Um, Mrs. Crater and he says, oh, my name might be such and such, or I could tell you my name is such and such from this town, or I could tell you my name is such and such from this town. In that extension of the story, Flannery picked one of them and had him really be one of those people. So he, he gave her the truth as if it were a lie and, you know, continued to say that his name was Mr. Um, was Mr. Shiflet. I, I asked um, because I had my money on Aaron Sparks, um, uh, which was the, uh, just some kind of uh, his, his, um, his match uh, burning down to his face. Well, of course. Uh, There's fire symbolism uh, in there. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the other thing I was going to say was that uh, uh, when you talk about, um, when you talk about um, uh, here in Caldwell, uh, I heard, um, uh, I couldn't think, couldn't help but glance over to Welty's, uh, the hitchhikers, uh, as, um, as, a, as a connection uh, mm -hmm. between, between uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, if I may, because uh, yeah. I've read this well, version and it's Aaron Sparks. Oh, it is Aaron Sparks. Yeah. And where is he from? Do you remember? Uh, I, he was, no, I don't remember that. Uh, I just remember he was in Mobile uh, and he was Dingleberry, Georgia? Yeah, and with his wife and then she... Actually, I re if I'm not mistaken, the manuscript said... Uh, that she knew him by Aaron Sparks. So I don't know if it's actually his real name or if it's one of those names. Right, she but... might have just tried out different pseudonyms. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then story. there was that gentleman this, at the 430 session who claims that Shiflet is an actual name used in rural Georgia, right? right. So everything's real and everything's phony. Yeah. Well, speaking of names. <laughs> Speaking of names, when I was um, at the archives in Amory, um, there's a list of people who, you know, uh, Regina took, of the people who sent flowers, this is to the funeral, or whatever, sent telegrams, and there is one, um, Lucy P. Nell, and then it said, for Cleo. Um, so Nell's the last name. I looked in her address, on O'Connor's address books, didn't see a Lucy Nell in there. But didn't you tell me that there was like a Lucy Nell that lived across the street from like where O'Connor is actually buried? Isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, and, and you know, and I don't know all the details of that, but when I moved here in 2003, uh, and was just getting used to the shock of Milledgeville and yeah. this job, Sarah Gordon one day just casually said, oh, I went to Lucy Nell's funeral the other day. And she meant the character, you know, that the person who was the basis for the character had just died in 2003. Wow. 50, no, uh, yeah, 50 years after the, after the story is written, basically. And that uh, she lived a long life and, and Sarah told me that she had inherited a house and that she was okay. But she also said that she had a serious disability, that it wasn't 
it wasn't particularly exaggerated. It was somebody who had a, um, a, a major disability that she put into that story. Flannery just wrote up all the people she narrowed down and never made anything up. <laughs> yeah, that's a possibility. Oh, there's mine. Yeah, um, uh, Bruce, yeah. as we're on the topic of uh, names, I was curious as to if you had any thoughts about the correlation of the name Hotspot towards the end of the story to any kind of relation to the restaurants in and around Milledgeville and Baldwin County at the time that Flannery might have lived in Milledgeville and Baldwin County or anywhere else um, during her lifetime. Um, mm -hmm. In that, um, the fact that uh, this story might be related to her personal experience. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if somebody could pin down, you know, which building in the area was the hotspot. I mean, I've had people tell me, oh, they know which local restaurant had a monkey beside a china berry tree. And uh, there's, a, there's a building out on the end of um, King's Road out to the southeast of town out here that I think is supposed to be a place that appears in a, uh, a story someplace. Uh, Landry used what she had. And uh, I know that exact same place that in. you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and why shouldn't we and don't all writers do that? And um, of course she did. And it would be interested, it would be interesting to know more about those connections, and I wish somebody else other than me would take that on, because I'm I find I'm very bad at it keeping keeping details straight. You know, I'm just terrible at actually sticking to the facts. I want to make things up <laughs> that I'm um, that I'm imagining. I'm afraid. I mean, I always read about the hot. You know, before I lived, before I moved here, I just thought, oh, it's hell. Uh, that's the hot spot. And you know he's dumping her off in hell, and why not right. call? Why not right. call um, uh, a restaurant that? And of course, in an earlier session today, we had a little conversation about, and I think this is I think this was really great. That he dumps her off in a diner, but he's driving from, I guess, Georgia to uh, Alabama both of which have mental institutions where a husband could easily dispose of a wife. Fill out a form in five minutes, sign here, and we'll take her off your hands and lobotomize her and sterilize her, probably. And right. I think that's a brilliant observation that I did not come up with, and it's horrifying. I've never wanted to believe that Lucy Nell was in that much danger at the end of the story. But, you know, if you read Mab Segrist's book for her, you know, uh, Administrations of Lunacy for a while, you will, you will agree with her, I think, that uh, the asylums of the South haunt all of the literature. And uh, the idea that we could all end up in an asylum and have uh, you know people try out their new technology on us is um, and their new theories about uh, you know human psychology it's it's always just right there and you don't have to come out and say it in uh, southern literature it's it's always there in the background it's like saying slavery is always in the background of everything that's written in the south. Uh, and I guess so are the um, so are the mental institutions, and uh, you know could have been worse. What happened to um, to Lucy Nell? And you know, and I, I'm 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 unhappy to say I can't rule out that that's what might happen to her at the end of the story if she's abandoned a hundred miles away from from home and 
nobody's willing to take on the work of finding out how to deliver her back to dear old mom. Um, I've just always wanted to read the end of the story and say, oh, well, she'll be okay. And that's why, and that's why O'Connor doesn't try to uh, spell it out and get carried away with that, with that um, tangent. Because I think she's, she's thinking of this as a story that's basically about shiftlet. And everybody else is supposed to contribute to how we feel about, about that part. Okay, next topic I want to bring up, so you can go back to anything, is disability studies. Um, we've, we have lots of literary scholars nowadays who want to say that that's their specialization, that they look at all literature and they, and they, they look for the ways in which everybody's got something like a disability. People who did disability studies, oh, by the way, love talking about Flannery O'Connor. Um, and you look at somebody who supposedly has a disability and you say, okay, what's the nature of this disability? Is it really a disability? Is this ability a disability that has benefits to the um, person? And there are plenty of people who want to look at Flannery O'Connor and say, she is number one example of somebody who was labeled disabled. Oh, she's going to die soon. You know, she has lupus and it worked for her in every way. You know, she never had to do a chore in her life. Just devote yourself to your, to your little stories over there in the corner, honey, and we won't bother you with the fact that this is a working farm. Um, you know, do whatever you please. Um, you know, I guess she watched a dish once in a while, but you know, Flannery did not have, you know, the obligatory chores around the house that might have been um, dumped on another woman who, another daughter, who uh, wasn't labeled as being uh, disabled. Okay, but where I wanted to go with this is the question of how are we supposed to regard Lucy now? She's got a disability and is there any sense, I mean, I think the story might be asking, is there any sense that where she's better off with a disability than without? Is a disability something that saves her from the machinations of Mr. Shiflett and the machinations of her mother? Um, and another angle on this, I mean, there are lots of things you can do thinking about disabilities. I've heard people say that the worst thing you can do when you start thinking about disability in literature is to say that just because somebody has a disability, they have to be the hero of the story. You have to be total, you have to have total sympathy for them, that they become perfect because they're disabled, that they become, dare I say it, an angel of God. Well, this story has character who just comes right out and says, Oh, she's disabled. She's an angel of God. And he means it as a compliment. I don't think there's any question about that. But people who do disability studies will say, and I think they're right, that sometimes when we quickly automatically look at something, somebody with a disability and we say, oh, aren't they sweet? Aren't they, um, aren't they better than all the rest of us? that there's a certain um, reduction, a certain dehumanizing that's, that's going on. And I have on occasion heard people refer to this story and say, O'Connor is making that very mistake, that she agrees with the guy who's working the counter in the hot spot, looking at this character that she's created and saying, oh, she's just pure and wonderful in every way and she's just angelic, and so she's not a real character. Um, and, you know, it's a fault and the story. Now, that is not my attitude. I am just reporting what somebody else has said about this story. I but, think that she's a character. I think she's a human being. But we can't. She's a really great character. Yeah. We can't discount how people thought of these things then. We're a lot more educated, I think, I mean, I know, about, you know. They weren't as advanced as we are. <laughs> well, I mean, people, but we think of this sort of stuff now, we didn't think of it then. 
Sure. He didn't. And I mean, really, Lucy Nell's only choice would be to become, so I hate to say this, uh, join up with a sideshow where she would be taken advantage of there. That's next month's story where she could be in the freak show. Yeah. And, and they would have come up with some kind of story about her so she could pass out the postcards and stuff. You know, when we have, we have either the asylums or we have the freak shows. And, but that's kind of where we were then. And so, yeah. you know, so yeah, I, can, good, I, can, I can understand that way of looking at it. But I can also say uh, O'Connor is experiencing disability from the inside too. You know, she tells those stories about um, being on an elevator and having somebody look at her crutches and saying, oh, aren't you sweet, darling? And, uh, you know, Flannery would want to slug them. Don't tell me I'm sweet and perfect just because I got this crutch on me. And I think, you know, she must have experienced that for some time. And she might be putting it in this, in this story. And so I think there are some details about Lucy Nell that are thrown into the story precisely to keep her from looking like a simple version of an angel of God. My, my favorite example is when they're driving away and um, she's in her wedding outfit and she's got that hat on with the cherries and she's plucking the cherries and throwing them out the window. Uh, yeah, I think that's sexual symbolism. And Lucy Nell is looking forward to the wedding night and what she's going to do with this guy who's been, she's been studying since the day he walked up to their, their house. I don't think that's what the guy at the hot spot is thinking when he, thinking about when he says she's an angel of God. And I think Flannery is saying uh, she is more complicated than she looks. The whole thing about uh, the language acquisition of, of Lucy Nell Crater, she hadn't learned to say a word in all this time. And Mr. Shiflett, who's, I don't think a teacher, um, manages to teach her a word and, and you know, kind of looks like she might learn another word. Makes me think maybe Flannery wants us to figure out that uh, she's got some potential here. She's being held back by mom and even somebody like Mr. Shiflett could wake her up and change her life and we don't know where Lucy Nell will, will um, be in a few years. You know, um, I, I think, well, to me, that's, that's the train of thought I find myself getting on when I think about what's going to, what's disability say is going to do with this story. And it's the disability of Lucy Nell can be used to limit her, to make her a stereotype, to make her simple, to make her kind of a minor character, a little prop in the story that's, who's just there so that the, t the other two characters can fight over her. But I think Flannery O'Connor wants us to say uh, she's much more complicated than she looks. Angel of God is not necessarily a compliment and it certainly is um, limiting. Two thoughts. Yeah, uh, go ahead. One is, um, uh, is uh, uh, thinking about adding Mr. Shiflett to the discussion of disability and, and, and Lucy Nell, oh, yeah, yes. uh, big Lucy's, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ugly words. Um, and um, I mean, they really, they really vibrate, um, it reverberate in, in the story. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I was thinking was, I th was thinking across to Holga Joy and to the situation of mother, daughter, uh, and, um, uh, and disability and uh, a mother's desire to have a conventional daughter um, who will Marry who will be pretty, who will um, you know, uh, and and that that pressure, which is you know, I think mother daughter agony in, in O'Connor. Right, and we're all very comfortable now with the idea of talking about good country people as a story that's very 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 autobiographical, and you know we don't have to put that much effort into this story to see it as a, another set of revelations about, about what's going on here. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I forget to bring up the fact that, that uh, Mr. Shifflett has the one arm, you know? And, and what's wrong with me that I, I don't bring up the fact that he's uh, disabled? Because I just don't have an opinion about it. I don't have a bright idea to steal from somebody even about what that means. Um, uh, he's not say, limited. No, but he doesn't. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I forgot too until you know. But he's not limited by the arm, so we forget it. We see it in the very beginning, but then it's it's not part of who he is, which yeah. is you know how we should think of people like you know with with whatever. Well, and so yeah. she treats him as a whole person, a whole bad person, but <laughs> but a whole person. But he also, he comes on the farm, you know, and, and the, the lines are there to describe his disability. And then there's just this long catalog of he does this and he does this and he does this and he does this and he does this. He deals with his disability. It doesn't hold him back none. And maybe we're supposed to say, okay, so couldn't Lucy Nell do the same thing? She hadn't yet. All she's done is learn a few chores that Mama wanted done around the house, I guess. But, you know, uh, if, if, if O'Connor is equating disabilities, I don't know if she is, uh, is she suggesting that the pattern that we see at the beginning about how Mr. Shifflett's able to uh, deal with his disability at least raises the question, could we say the same thing could happen with Lucy now? Especially if he's a jerk and she's good, why shouldn't a good person be able to do as much as as this bad, bad, bad man, um, Mr. Shifflett is able to do. Because she doesn't have intelligence. She doesn't oh. have, Shifflett has intelligence. She doesn't, you know, Holga has well, intelligence. That is an answer. And Holga has intelligence. Yeah. But know, there uh, are those green shoots of thoughts um, uh, in her. She's desert. green in the desert. She, she's driving away, yeah. And, you know, What's the desert? Is it Lucinelle's mind? I used to read it that way. I just could, easy, could just as easily read the shoot of grain is in this whole setting in which she and Mr. Shiftlet and her mother are currently existing. She is the hope for a, um, a new world in this, in this uh, kind of desolate, <laughs> desolate place that we find ourselves in at the beginning of the at the beginning of the um, of the story. Can uh, I just say something yeah, uh, sure. about uh, the angel of God thing? Mm -hmm. is that there, there is another character that's mentioned and compared to an angel of God, which is Mr. Shiftless mother. Mother. And I thought that was relevant too, because maybe he saw a little bit of his mother in Lucinau or something and that she's a little bit older than him maybe. Sure, that might be why maybe she's a little bit older. actually did realize that she was older. Yeah. One year, it, she's his mother. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and there is another mother complicated relationship there, uh, sure. I think. Well, okay, and when he abandons uh, Lucy Nell at the hot spot, it's like he's repeating the crime from his past where he abandoned his mother. I mean, it seems to me that that's the pattern that you're supposed to pick up on, even though there are only two instances of it. And then the hitchhiker says, really, women are disgusting. Your mother's terrible. My mother's terrible. And I think that that hitchhiker is there to be the double of Mr. Shiflet and to say what he really feels. You know, you don't really need the hitchhiker to tell this story. He's, he's just a, a wonderful add on. Uh, and I think, oh, you know, especially since I know now that, that O'Connor wrote about the childhood of, of Mr. Shiflett in some of her manuscript material, I think, well, maybe we should look at this character who pops up at the end and say, he's another version of, uh, of Mr. Shiflett, who just hadn't gotten his own car yet, you know, hadn't gotten around to it. <laughs> he might be on the lookout for a car as soon as he leaves Mr. Shiflett at the end. Uh, maybe he's another version of the same thing. And and the hatred of women is, you know, like a key to what's going on with Mr. Shiflett, a hatred of women that he can't allow himself to express directly. You know, he's got to say he loves them. 
to the point of idealizing his mother, to the point of going and getting married um, officially, but that there's, you know, maybe zero um, feeling behind any of it. Well, isn't the uh, only yes. truth? Isn't the only truth teller in the story really the hitchhiker? You know, Mr. Shiflet, I mean, one of the things, he's sh shifty, he's shiflet, shiftless. Mm -hmm. and, and the only thing you know about him is you don't know about him. Mm -hmm. And the mother is always trying to play something political. And so she's never talking. Mm -hmm. So this is the only third person you actually see talking. Mm -hmm. sure. And he actually tells the truth. Yeah, right. I think so. So there's a reason to have him in the story to... Um, you know, to shock you with just a little bit of truth that that makes you realize how used you've gotten in the course of the story to listening to these people lie to each other in every way that they can um, in every way that they can come up with. Yeah, I think that's uh, um, you know part of what's going on here. And I've only got one more idea, but uh, if anybody else has got anything they want to say about this story, key to it I was all, just going to follow up on what you were saying by asking if you had any thought about what Mr. Shiflet might be working on the boy in the car. That is, uh, uh, is the, or do you read that just as his, as his needing to riff on himself at this point, um, or uh, is he beginning another con? Um, and, and how does that work? I mean, I just... Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, looked at that relationship for a minute and said, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I get it. Um, hmm. um, I've, I've never really thought about it that much. Somebody I, pointed out earlier today that, you know, this was probably the first time that O'Connor uses the name Tarwater in the piece of writing. That's one of the names that gets thrown around and it's gonna become, um, the name of major characters in the Violet Barrett Away. Well, another thing that's in the Violet Barrett Away is hitchhikers. You know, um, um, Tarwater is hitching rides all the time. And it seems to me, um, you know, a pattern is that, is that people just talk to keep themselves awake, you know, in, in those uh, hitchhiking scenes in the Violet Barrett Away that they don't intend for there to be a whole lot of a whole lot of um, meaning to it necessarily. But as I hear those words coming out of my mouth, I think, well, now could Flynn rewrite something and say it's just filler, or that it's not meaningful if she had to have something in mind. I think I, I think see Carol's Carol hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? So I spent a lot of time in a footnote. Uh, mm -hmm talking about that relationship because I think Mr. Shiflet meets his match with the hitchhiker and I think he sees a younger version of himself because mm -hmm. in that car ride Mr. Did Shiflet I steal this from you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh wait a minute I, I had to leave just a minute I might be repeating something you've already said but he Mr. Shiflet is just spouting off cliches about his mother and, the, and then the hitchhiker cuts right through them with that um my, you know, your mother is a stinking polecat. I forget the line, mm -hmm. but um, he's the only, he's the one who can just see through Mr. Shiflet's cliches. So I always thought of the hitchhiker as a younger version of himself because you feel like the story is just going to repeat itself with a new con. Well, and Carol, you have taught me that spouting cliches can be a strategy for bonding. Yeah. So maybe Mr. Shiflet at the end is in his weird way, trying to be nice to this little kid by well, saying some safe nothing. Well, I uh, think he sees himself in in. And he sees himself in. They're they're from the same um, they're from the same you know, trashy background. So and. Which brings us all together. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shiflet has been trying to elevate himself in relation to others. So um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I thought I saw another hand up once. Okay, maybe we got to all of that. Okay. Uh, I do. I have a question, Bruce. A, sure, go ahead. Um, when, I keep going back to when Mr. Shiflet says, but I have a moral intelligence. You know, where, where does that come from? <laughs> yeah. You know, and why, are, are, you know, yeah, he's, it's one of his bigger, bigger lies, but, yeah, you know, have you ever thought about, have people written well, I think about he that? he does have a moral intelligence. Yeah. 
I mean, one of the comparisons people make is uh, that Mr. Shiflet is another version of the misfit and a good man is hard to find. And my God, people make the misfit into a theologian. You know, they take everything he says uh, about his, his evilness as a serious philosophical position and that he's thought through everything. And that, it's not hard to make that sort of attitude towards a character bleed over into Mr. Shiflet and say, um, We can't hear. Serious thoughts. You can't hear? Yeah. We need to turn it up a little bit. Oh, okay. He does, he does think serious thoughts and then he, he doesn't take them where they need to go. And that's, it seems to me, that's why he can say at the end of the story, oh, Lord, break forth and wash the swine from this earth. Because he knows he's a fraud. He knows better than what he's done. He, um, he loathes himself. That's his best feature. <laughs> you might say is that at least he's not pleased with himself at the end. Um, over over what he's done, and you know, we would like for him to do better than he than he does for himself at the at the end of the uh, at the end of the story. I think but Harriet I think wants to add. To this. Yeah. I think he has a moral intelligence. Sure. Yeah. And how to. much good does that do you? You know, having a moral intelligence may hold you back plenty. Mm -hmm. Being an idiot might be your salvation. <laughs> What did it do for Harry Bevel? He had very little moral intelligence. And I would say Flannery's writing that story to say, well, it doesn't hold him back none. It's gonna be just fine. We're gonna we're all gonna agree we want everything to be as good as it can possibly be for Harry Bevel in this world. Um, okay, my last thought is nobody knows what the car means. Nobody knows what the house means in this story, that everything that Mr. Shiflet says about that can be flipped on its head. It could all mean just exactly the opposite and probably does at the same time that he thinks he means what he says about that. I would say that is uh, the business about the car in this, in this story is, uh, and that speech about the car versus the house. Um, that's um, a part of the story that can just be turned uh, like a Rubik's cube in all sorts of which ways. And it's um, an immensely rich creative thing that O'Connor has put in there. And it sounds so simple when it comes out of his mouth. And I think I will never figure out all that's going on with that, um, all that's going on with that speech. Anything else, folks, before we, before we call it a night and say we figured it all out and we've answered all the questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's it then. Okay, that's it. Well, good, good night, night everybody. Good night. Have a good night. Next time we'll pick a simple story. <laughs> we'll be oh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Bye, Carol.